South Africa is considered by many as one of Africa's top democracies. It is also considered one of the continent's most developed countries. In fact, it hosts a huge number of billionaires on the African continent. Because of this, it has the spotlight of the world. Dr. Ekpo Suve is one of South Africa's billionaires. He is of a different view and he feels that the democracy of this developed country is on a downward trend. He gave us an opportunity to talk to him on why he feels South Africa's democracy is shrinking. He feels that the current government of the ANC under President Cyril Ramaphosa is launching attacks against his business because of his political views and lack of support for the ANC under Cyril Ramaphosa. What is the truth to this, given that bank accounts of his own person, as well as his businesses, have been closed down? Accusations of wrongdoing by himself and his businesses? We sat down with him and asked him the tough questions. My name is Dingindaba Jonah Buyoya. Welcome to this day. Dr. Iqbal Savi, thank you so much for hosting us here. Thank you for having me on your show and welcome to Cape Town. Thank you. There's a lot going on and I think I've learned a lot more of what's going on the uh, last two days that I've been here. But let's start off from here. Segunjalo and independent media are being attacked by President Ramaphosa. That's one of the sentiments that you've shared before in one of the articles that I've read. And I'd like to ask why you feel this way. You know, we've, we've stated publicly on many occasions that um, our group is the target of a smear campaign, the use of state apparatus. But beyond that, we've actually gone and instituted a uh, Section 3 notice summons against the government for 75 billion for the damages that our group has suffered. Because first of all, um, it is based on the actual action of uh, the, the president's um, people in trying to shut down independent media in various ways. It is based on the use of regulatory institutions against us it is uh, based on the use of commissions against us. And all of this is set out, in fact, in our papers in terms of the, the suing of the government itself. So um, the reason is very simple. Uh, the current president is uh, somebody that um, wants to control uh, all of the media in the country. And he wants to be in charge of, um, I would say, all of the resources that should be friendly to him. Ours, our media, which is the largest print media group and one of the largest online, uh, second largest online in the country, is far more balanced in our reporting. We point out uh, the issues that face the country. Uh, we are critical at times, not always, of the president. Uh, our journalists have, for instance, exposed the PPE corruption, the looting of state-owned enterprises like ESCOM, Transnet, um, SAA, they've exposed the president's own funders where he raised about two billion for his party campaign. They've exposed the Palapala scandal. Now, being the president and his close confidence, they're very unhappy with that. They would prefer that um, all the media remain silent on those issues and spin stories around that. Now, we haven't because, you know, we really believe that um, to have uh, our, our constitutional democracy uh, defended and to reach its full potential, it's important that the public be made aware of these things. And I guess at the end of the day, we've angered powerful politicians, powerful people of the business community that fund these politicians that now want to see you know, our businesses um, gone because uh, without us, the country will not be able to, to hear and read uh, what is really going on. Very bold 
accusations that you level against uh, the president of South Africa and a lot of other businessmen that you've not mentioned here, but they've also put up their own accusations against you and your businesses. And perhaps we should run through some of the things that have been said. You were publicly a part of the uh, commission that was set up against South Africa's uh, pro uh, Public Investment Commission, and the belief is that there was wrongdoing in the way that one of your businesses was, uh, you know, uh, the, one of your businesses partnered with the PIC here. Do you believe that there is any credibility uh, to these accusations that ultimately led to this public commission? And I know you say no, so why? Well, it's, it's not what I believe. Let's look at the facts, because the facts must speak for themselves. In the first instance, there was a commission headed by a retired judge, Lexham Party, and two other commissioners that was set up by the president not to investigate us, just to be very clear. In fact, we were never part of the terms of the commission. The commission was set up to investigate the Public Investment Corporation, which is an asset manager which is controlled by the government. And it was looking into the governance practices of the PIC. Now, what had happened during this commission, it was turned into a smear campaign against our group and it was very well organized. So we had a specific, uh, one of the commissioners, Jill Marcus, who we showed was compromised subsequently, uh, you know, making certain allegations against us. I went myself to the commission. I volunteered to go, in fact, to the commission and I had a big fight with Ms. Marcus about the transformation of this economy and about the role of the PIC. Nowhere during this commission's findings was there any uh, finding against our group. Simply inferences were made against our group. And some of these inferences were that one of the investments that the PIC had invested in, which was called IO Technologies, uh, which had listed on Johannesburg Stock Exchange, for some way or another, you know, the PIC had not um, uh, done its proper processes in terms of the IO investment. But that was completely wrong, as has subsequently been shown. So in a number of different ways. In the first instance, based on this kind of smear campaign, a number of the PIC representatives were coached to come to the Commission and say certain things. And believing these things, the PIC took IO to court, in fact, in the Cape High Court. And what was the outcome of that? Almost every single person that went to the PIC Commission, their version changed completely in court, because now they were under oath. A commission, you must never forget, is not a court of law. You and I can go to any commission and say anything, because it's got no relevance in law whatsoever. But when you approach a court of law, you're under oath, and you cannot lie in a court of law. And so what happened? We were fully vindicated in that the PIC had to settle with IO. And that was a vindication on, on our side and we've always maintained. Notwithstanding that, we took this commission on review in the Cape High Court. And pointedly, the commissioners themselves uh, re removed the opposition to our review. The only entity that kept the opposition to our review is the presidency. And three years later, they still have not filed their answering papers to our review because it served their interest to keep it going. But more than above that, we appointed one of the most senior retired judges, Judge Heath, a, a corruption buster in South Africa, well known under Thabo Mbeki for his corruption busting activities. We asked him to please investigate these allegations independently. Judge Heath came out with a comprehensive report, it said, first of all, there is no basis to these allegations. The second Jolly group has done nothing wrong. IO has done nothing wrong. And he concludes his report with the following statement. He says that this party commission is a grave injustice to second Jolly and Dr. Survey. And in fact, they should sue the government for this report. He says that in his full report. So it's not what I believe. The facts are to the contrary. And this was a well-designed attempt to smear us. And I always say this to people. Had we done something wrong, 
Today, we would have been charged by prosecuting authorities or any other because Ramaphosa controls all of these state entities. But they haven't because the facts are that we have done nothing wrong. It, by the PIC's own admission, it was a, a very good investment, but it was the smear campaign designed to make it seem that we had done nothing wrong. We had, we had done something wrong. Uh, one more point I want to make. Our group has been in existence for more than two decades. We are one of the leading black groups in South Africa. We are one of only two black entities that are part of about 20 companies of South Africa, part of the World Economic Forum. The others are mining houses, the big banks, etc. In our 20 years, we have never done anything wrong. We've been um, model citizens, we've operated with integrity, we've built our group you know, on proper, proper uh, values and practices. And I can proudly say that if there's anyone in our organization that commits any kind of corruption or fraud, we would be the first to actually take them and prosecute them ourselves. And that has been our mantra since the inception because um, we, you know, we don't have a lot of tender businesses. Almost, I would say, 80, 90 percent of our business is private sector. Uh, we've built up a huge industrial conglomerate from a very variety of sectors. So we have no, you know, we have no need, firstly, to be corrupt. It's a very big business. But we've rejected corruption. We believe corruption kills the economy of a country, and we should be model citizens. So, so in that, and that is why we've gone to great lengths to take the Sympathy Commission on review. But it is government that deliberately is preventing that review process from proceeding. Because as in the court case, the government will be humiliated. But we've gone a step further, by the way. Because government has stalled this process, we have instituted a what is called the Section 3 summons for 75 billion in damages against Ramaphosa, the presidency, and various state organs for the smear campaign against our group. And in the midst of all this, some of your critics say that why these eyebrows have been raised and all these issues um, have come up is because they suggest that you had a very close relationship with uh, one Dr. Dan Majil, who was the CEO of this very PIC. And the concern is uh, a businessman of your stature, being close friends uh, with such a man who uh, is in charge of an institution that ultimately invests in Segunjalo, reeks of something wrong. Uh, would you explain this bit uh, of what's going on? It is not true that we were close friends. It is not true by any means. Dr. Machila is a, a, a very accomplished former professor, the head of the PIC, that built up the institution from $400 billion to $2 trillion. Uh, sorry, 400 billion rand to 2 trillion rand. Uh, I am a captain of industry. I, like many other captains of industry, engage with numerous asset managers in this country, whether it is at the World Economic Forum, whether it is other, at other meetings. I was chairman of the BRICS Business Council. So it is not unusual for me to engage with Dr. Machila. So there's nothing unusual about that, as I would engage with other asset managers, with other business leaders, etc. There's absolutely nothing irregular about that relationship. And in fact, if you look at the court case of between IO and the PIC, every single PIC senior executive came there and said, Dr. Machula had nothing to do with this investment in IO. Fifteen senior executives with a combined work experience of more than 60 years at the PIC stood up and said, we made this investment because we believed it was a very good investment, and not Dr. Machila. So there was a campaign to try and paint this relationship in this way. And that's where I agree with Dr. Machila wholeheartedly, by the way, is that the PIC for too long has funded white businesses in South Africa. So 97 to 98% of the Johannesburg Securities Exchange is owned by white entities or white companies. The PIC controls about 15% of that, I think the combined market cap is about 12 trillion. Dr. Machila, I believe, tried to change that to give black businesses more of a say 
in the primary economy, the macroeconomy of the country. And he made powerful enemies in, in trying to do that. And so where I agree with him absolutely was that his commitment to transformation of the economy is something that I definitely support as well. And so do many other people. And I think he made a terrible mistake in that he tried to, to, to make these changes to support more black businesses with credible businesses uh, on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange and on the in the macroeconomy of the country, and this angered powerful white interests in particular, and they went for him as well. So, in a way, I feel actually quite sympathetic to Dr. Machila, because he's an unbelievable professional that has been smeared, you know, by by the establishment for trying to transform the country's biggest asset manager to allocate capital to black asset managers. In the first instance. And in fact, to, to make sure that black businesses have a say. Because, you know, you cannot have a situation um, 30 years later into our democracy that black people only own less than 3% of the capital markets. That's just not acceptable. Hmm. Let's, let's talk about a, bit, a bit about uh, IO technologies. I mean, there's also um, a lot that's been said about it. And one of the outstanding things um, is how there's accusations that the value, the actual value of IO uh, technologies before the investment was inflated to have the uh, PIC invest much more than they should have already. And these accusations are that this was very deliberately done. Was it deliberately done? No, but that is exactly that. That was the smear campaign. And if you look at the prospectus of IO, if you look at who was involved, it was the leading corporate um, f firms in South Africa, it was PSG Capital, the leading audit firm, you know, all of these leading companies set up the prospectus. But leave that for the moment. Ignore the reality that this was more than a hundred page prospectus done by the JSC, you know, signed off, etc. at various levels. Leave all of that. Go to the IOPIC court case, which happened last year. What happened in that case? Every single senior executive of the PIC that came to court changed their version from the party commission. What did they say in the court case? Under oath, they said, in fact, the valuation that they had for IO was greater than the valuation at which they listed the company. So you had 15 <laughs> senior executives who have a combined 60-year experience in asset management, investment banking, corporate finance, etc., coming to a court under oaths and saying this was never overvalued. In fact, if anything, it was undervalued. It was a fantastic investment. Those minutes of the court case or the transcripts are fully available for anybody to access from the Cape High Court. If you look at the lead in, uh, person there, um, Lebo Khang Molabatsi, uh, you know, who, who was involved in the uh, asset management part of the business, the investing, he goes into great detail and explains why this was a fantastic investment. A very different testimony to what happened at the Party Commission, because at the Party Commission was a smear campaign by Ramaphosa and his proxies. And people were coached, they were threatened, they were told that they must say certain things, and if they didn't do that, because you see, it's not a court of it's not a court of law, but when you get to a court of law, it's a very different ball game, because then you're under oath, and if you don't say the truth, you know you're committing perjury, right? And so when all of that came out, it shocked everybody, and despite the truth having now come out, the competitor media in this country did not cover the truth. They did not cover the fact that every single one of these people had changed their version. And in the end, the PIC still. It's a good thing the PIC settled because, you know, we can all move on with our lives. And, um, uh, and at the end of the day, it is pensioners' money and we need to protect that money. And we need to make sure that it is, is invested properly along with our own money. So people often forget that we ourselves have invested many billions into that company and the PIC alongside of us. You know, we have to date invested close on to 20 billion in South Africa's economy. 
And there's only three investments in our entire group of 200 investments over a 20-year period that the PIC is a partner or a co-investor. So people often forget that, you know. So let's say, for example, if we had so much influence as they claim, don't you agree that out of our 200 investments, the PIC should at least have invested in about 20 or 30 of them? No, they in fact have only invested in three investments. And, uh, uh, and in any case, they are co-investors with us. And so are many other asset managers, many other institutional investors and others. And people ignore that reality. This partnership um, seems to have brought a lot more trouble um, uh, than, than good to, to Segun Jalo um, and independent media. Because uh, when you talk about independent media, there is also the controversy that uh, surrounded the shifting of, uh, of shares into a new venture. And again, this brought around new accusations against the business and the relationship that exists between yourselves and the PIC. What exactly is going on here with this transaction uh, of these shares as well? No, I think we must go back in time. Let's first go back in time to 2013, when Second Jalo Consortium acquired independent media from the Irish Independent Media Group. So independent media is the largest print media and online media group combined in the country. It's a very important player in the media space. It was always, the media in South Africa until 2013 was always controlled by the same people that controlled it during apartheid. We were the first black entity to actually buy an, a media house outright. There were other attempts at minority investments, uh, but we were the first to fully buy and acquire and control a media house, especially the site. This shocked everyone. Our partners in this were about 30 NGOs, um, union groupings, etc. And the PIC was a partner, and so were uh, the Chinese through CCTV and um, one of the other, the CAD Fund in Africa, and ourselves. Together, we acquired independent media at the time. It's very important to understand that Dr. Machila was not the CEO of the PIC at the time. So as much as people say this, out of our three investments, he was not the CEO of the PIC. There was a different CEO at the time of the PIC. And this was an investment to bring back to South Africa a media house that should belong to South Africans that was sold to the Irish. When we did that, um, more or less the same time, uh, we experienced a huge blowback from the establishment because, you know, there's an unwritten rule. You can have a little bit of political power but zero media power and zero economic power. Now, we were now going into two domains and competing with white businesses in this country. One was in the economy of the country, and secondly, it was the media. Had I known the media would, would, would cause all these problems for us, maybe I might not have acquired the media at the time. But we did it for transformation purposes, to tell the story of black Africans, you know, which is very different to what you had read prior to our acquisition of this group uh, you know, uh, from, from the Irish. At the time, there was also winds of change in media. It's very important to understand that technology played a big change. Online, for example, news, advertising had shifted to Google, Facebook, etc., etc. So media experience, the printing costs had gone up, you know, to be a traditional media house with 20 newspapers has become, became very, very difficult because of the technology shifts in the media space. Also, we had inherited expensive structures uh, from the Irish, for example, newspaper house in Cape Town was a, a business the Irish sold, uh, um, a, a office block they sold to a private entity and signed a 12-year lease. And we had to end up paying 20 million a year in, in these costs. So we, we had those kind of headwinds that we had to face as an organization. At the same time, we are a very successful group. As I explained to you, we've been a World Economic Forum member since 2000 and, and 2007. And um, we, we are admitted as one of the world's fastest growing companies. And we've made enormous technology investments. So when the, um, when the, the term of the investment 
by all of us in the independent media came sort of was coming to an end, the PIC realized, you know, that the traditional media investment wasn't good for them, so did the Chinese, so did we ourselves, and requested from us, could they not convert their shareholding and their debt into that structure into what we call multi-sided platform companies, which is part of our group. These are e-commerce companies, digital companies, not in the media space. They software, you know, all those kind of things, etc. Those, the, the value of those entities was about 50 billion and they were going to list on the New York Stock Exchange. One of the reasons why we swing the government, the government prevented the listing. We had raised for that 400 million dollars offshore. And at the end of the day, the PIC, rightfully by the way, thought it's a smart decision to convert the equity and debt from independent media into the technology company for shares. We didn't want that actually because we didn't want to mix an old legacy business with a new business. But because we wanted to support the PIC and help them in their investment, we said, okay, let's do that. When we did that, that anchored the establishment again because they now saw a very large uh, technology entity with huge capacity to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, that would be have a market capitalization of between five and ten billion US dollars. And we'd really had, we were really given permission to list in New York. Uh, in fact, there's a photograph of myself and my family ringing the, the, the bell on the New York Stock Exchange. So they saw that this is giving a lifeline to independent media, which was of course beneficial to the PIC and other shareholders. And they put up a huge resistance to this. Had we not included independent media, which we didn't want to do, by the way, in this conversion, then there would have been no issues with the listing of um, this company, Sagamata, on the New York Stock Exchange. So, yeah, so at the end of the day, it was actually a good decision for the PIC at the time. And the issue came up because Sagamata did not list, now did it? And, and the, the concern was that the PIC was investing in a business that you know was not yet functional no no that's not true by any means no no no. far from it no no let's let's look at the facts you see again this is based on the media so Sagamata was going to initially list on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and it had a valuation of 50 billion and this value was insisted by the Johannesburg Stock Exchange so Sagamata had to get two international entities that value technology companies like Facebook, like Google, etc. There was a company from uh, San Francisco, there was a company from Washington that the JSC had to approve. This was very unusual, by the way. It took an eight month process. This was all done, and these companies valued Sagamata at about 50 billion Rand. I forgot the dollar valuations now. It had been given the go-ahead to list by the JSC and we were three days from the actual listing when one of the people close to President Ramaphosa went to Subsi, got them to find one of the subsidiaries of a subsidiary of a subsidiary that had not completely filled in its um, returns and it was nonsense in the end. And so the JSC said to us, look, we're going to have to pull the listing until you sort that out and come back whenever, a month or two months time. We didn't go back to the JSC because at the same time, for the first time, the Reserve Bank of South Africa changed the rules in 2018 to allow NASPES um, subsidiary process to list in Amsterdam as a primary listing. In other words, since, aparte, since 94 to, to, to 2018, no South African company was allowed to list primarily on a foreign stock exchange. In 2018, Ramaphosa allowed NASPES to take a trillion rand out of South Africa to list in Amsterdam, their, their company called Process, which owns the shares in China in a company called Tencent. The rules were therefore changed for media tech companies to now do primary listings overseas. We then immediately uh, wrote to the Reserve Bank, had a meeting with them, put in the application to list 
Sagamata on the New York Stock Exchange or the Hong Kong Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. We went and visited those three international stock exchanges. We got an in-principle approval to list there. We went to the Reserve Bank who told us we left no problems listing in New York because that was now allowed as a primary listing. We raised $400 million from international investors. Our international advisory board had about $10 billionaires on it. Some of the world's most successful people, I can give you the list of all of them on the national advisory board. No South African company had that kind of international advisory board. Three months after we got the in principle go ahead from the Reserve Bank, they came back to us and said, no, Treasury has decided not to give you the right to list overseas, you have to wait. Two years later, they wrote back to us and said, you have to apply again. And that's why we're suing the government for that particular listing for about $3 billion. So that's, I think, uh, you know, part of the $75 billion that we're suing the government. So it is, this was a very successful company in various e-commerce businesses, um, software, network solutions, Unified Communications, these were in total about, about 30 companies, part of this group, incredibly successful, that were going to... The smallest part of this was the inclusion of independent media. So independent media in all of us made up less than, I would think, one or two percent of this group. So again, the media tried to project this differently. This would have been South Africa's first unicorn, by the way. Its listing would have put South Africa on the map. Uh, we were using part of the $400 million as the first round of, of raising capital to create 5,000 African jobs in the ICT and technology sectors. So it was really an African company for Africans to actually make the, the leap into the MSP space, the multi-sided platform space. But then came the banks um, and the issues that uh, you had to deal with with the banks and uh, by you I mean both uh, your businesses and yourself um, because banks uh, were closing their accounts and there's different versions of why this happened but I'd like to hear why it happened. Well let's start with the versions of the courts. So we took the banks to the courts um, for doing this and what did the Judge Delamo in the Western Cape High Court find. He said the following, what the banks are doing is highly irregular. Second Jala has done absolutely nothing wrong. And uh, this is nothing but, you know, pure targeting and discrimination. It's in his verdict. You can have, you can read it. Judge Francis said the same thing. Uh, there was the Competitions Commission, the Tribunal that said the same thing, etc. So let's look at the evidence in all of this. So what has happened? For a long time, Ramaphosa and the establishment and their businesses have tried to shut our businesses down. They use smear campaigns, they use their media, which you know they fund and they control, to write articles about us, and in particular about myself and the Second Jala group. So all of this creates the impression of wrongdoing. And in the end, they come back and they said, you know what, because the media has written all these things about you, you've become a reputational risk to us. Now, that's absurd. I mean, it's like anybody out there, if someone writes an article about you, your companies, the banks can close their accounts tomorrow morning. And we said, but that's absurd. How could you even do that? The banks have written to us, and we can give you copies of his letters, which say in so many words, we agree that you've never been corrupt. We agree that you've never been involved in money laundering. We agree that you've never done anything wrong. But you know what? Because you're a reputational risk. Now, the reputational risk is just an excuse because they tried everything to shut our businesses, to shut our media house, and it hasn't worked. So now what they've got to do is use the banks because who can run a business without a bank account? Nobody. And the banks are very concentrated in South Africa. There's a few banks that control everything. Five or six banks actually control everything in this country. And they all linked into the Ramaphosa Pravin Gordon Axis. It's important to understand that. They're all linked into establishment capital that existed prior to apartheid. So all these banks are really apartheid banks. Some of them may have black CEOs, but they're the same banks. And they're trying to use, in a way, sanctions, if you like, to shut down our accounts. The courts haven't accepted that. 
Of course, there have been some cases we've lost, but almost in every case we've won. And it's on technicalities. Now, we, what we did is, we said, okay, let's for the moment buy their argument. Even though the banks say we've done nothing wrong, even though the courts say we've done nothing wrong, let's say we did do something wrong. Let's play devil's advocate here for a minute. But then you have, on the other side, at least 50 white companies that have committed fraud by their own admission, that have been, been uh, noted in the State Capture Commission, that have stolen not 10 billion, 20 billion, 300 billion from the public and from the government, etc., that have looted enterprises. Not a single one of them has had the bank accounts closed. So let's take this devil's advocate argument and say, yes, maybe Second Jalo did something wrong. Let's just say that for a second, which is nonsense, of course. But then why don't you close the accounts of companies who actually committed fraud and crime? And, and I'm guessing that's because you don't agree with what the uh, Constitutional Court uh, said in, the, uh, in that appeal. Um, Judge Raylene Cately saying that it's because these had reformed, that they had... No, a, no, 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 far uh, from it. ...restructuring and had a new management. No, no, Constitutional Court has not actually looked at this matter at all. Let me explain to you. So, my point is that these are white companies, their accounts are open, nothing's done to them. We have done nothing wrong, but they call it reputational damage, and our accounts were closed, right? So, the judge in the Western Cape High Court said this is nonsense and we argued that this is racial discrimination against our constitution and we filed the case in the quality court which the banks have not um, do not want to hear they're delaying this case in the so the main case is a case about discrimination in the quality court of south africa that's the case the banks are are, are, are delaying this case with interlocutories because they know they're going to have a big problem in this case, right? So in the meanwhile, what the banks have done, they try to appeal interdicts to close the accounts so that we don't ever get to the main case. All these things on the way are just interdicts. So what actually happened was the following. NetBank in particular went to the SEA, the Supreme Court of Appeal saying, well, we are appealing the, the interdict win of Second Jala against NetBank. The, unbelievably, in the SEA, which normally has majority black judges, the five judges sit, uh, I don't think there's a case of ever in the SEA in the last few years where there have been five white judges. Unbelievably, in our case, on a discriminatory matter, we have five white judges that are allocated. On the same week, months, there wasn't... All the other cases had majority black judges and maybe one white judge or two white judges out of five. We had five white judges. Now, I mean, you can ask yourself the question. I have no problem with white judges. I'm not questioning the integrity of the judges. But our Constitution says not only must judges be appointed according to the demographics of our country, which is what the JSC does. But even at a court level, you can't have a discrimination case being heard by five white judges when no other cases are even heard by three white judges out of five. So this was absurd. And what did they say? The judges came there and bizarrely allowed an interim interdict to be appealed because they said we had accused NetBank of racism. And then they went even a step further. They started arguing the case for NetBank. They said that we had said three white companies, which we had EOH, Steinhoff, and Tongod, which are known to be white companies in South Africa, by the way, with a 70 to 90% white ownership. They said we didn't provide the evidence that they were white companies in our high court case. But we, needn't, we didn't need to provide the evidence because they are white. But... NetBank didn't argue that they were not white companies. What NetBank said was that these companies, um, you know, had reformed. Now, the point is not whether we did or did not reform, because to reform, you must do something wrong, right? If you go to church, for example, and you, 
committed a sin, you must repent. But must you repent if you haven't committed a sin? Come on, that's absurd, right? So we're saying to people, tell us what we did wrong. You give us one evidence. No one can produce any evidence of anything. In the same vein, with the SCA, these judges absurdly came to the conclusion that we did not provide the evidence that these were white companies in the Cape High Court case. But that's not for the Cape, for an interdict, that's for the Equality Court case. When we go and argue the Equality Court matter, we produce the evidence from the annual reports of these public companies that they were white. So they, in turn, what they did is that they ruled that the interdict is, is, is overturned. We took that on review to the Constitutional Court. And of course, what happened subsequently is that uh, Mr. Pravin Gordon's good friend, former retired judge, Zach Yacoub, was suddenly ejected to the Constitutional Court to hear appeals and to decide whether the court should hear certain appeals or should not, never mind the fact they must hear them, you know, sit in front of the court, whether it even gets to the judges. Because we are very confident when this matter gets to the Constitutional Court judges, they will see the constitutional issues in this matter quite easily. And so there was a deliberate attempt to block this. The matter in the Constitutional Court that you're referring to is the Competitions Commission matter. We took these banks to the Competition Commission on the basis that they have colluded with each other on the instruction of politicians to shut our accounts. The Competition Tribunal, which is the prosecuting authority of the Commission, absolutely agreed with us on that particular point. Three banks took out of the eight or nine banks, took that ruling on appeal to the Constitutional Appeal Court. What did they do? They brought in two other judges that normally don't sit in the Constitutional Appeal Court, who then ruled we never provided the evidence that the banks were colluding for the three banks. But the point is, it's not our duty to provide the evidence. There's the Competition Commission, which currently is busy with the investigation into precisely this point, the collusion of the banks against us. It is the same Competitions Commission that found that the banks colluded to manipulate the RAND and costing the country and its citizens hundreds of billions in value and leading to job losses in South Africa today. So it's very easy, and the way the media and the powerful, you know, the banks have five trillion of assets in South Africa at the moment. We're a tiny company. Yes, we're big relative to other companies. But compared to the banks, we are a tiny company, right? So we're trying to, to fight the banks. Now, the banks have one law which has been written in 2010 on their side, and that's famously called the Bredenkamp Judgment. Bredenkamp is well known to Southern Africa. In the Bredenkamp Judgment of 2010, the Supreme Court of Appeal gave the bank the right to shut down anybody's account at any time, for whatever reason. The banks had absolute power to do so. We are the first, the first company to challenge that law in this country because we are saying the banks have a public service. They're regulated by public institutions. They take public money. They therefore cannot unilaterally decide to shut down people's accounts. The banks discriminate against black people in this country. Black people pay higher interest rates. They want houses, they want cars, they want black people don't get credit from the blank banks in this country, right? I mean, it's a fact during COVID, you just look at the statistics. Government gave the banks 200 billion of guarantees. What did the banks do? 80% of that went to white companies and white individuals. It's a fact. It's written in the report. Unashamedly, the banks say, well, there was no risk there. If we gave it to black businesses for COVID, there's huge risk over there. It's absurd. The whole thing is absurd. So banks have enormous power. They're part of the establishment. We are the only company that has decided to challenge this authority of banks, which is unconstitutional. And therefore, we are taken the bread and come matter on review to the Constitutional Court. But to get there first, we have taken the banks to the Equality Court. And we are confident, by the way, that we will win in the Equality Court if we get there.
the bank strategy is to delay us getting to the equality court as long as possible, to use all of these interdicts and interlocutory applications to try and knock us out even before we get there. So then it brings the bigger question, um, which is with all of these things happening and with all of the side events, if I may put it that way, the big question is why is all of this happening? Why? Why do you think all of this is happening to Segun Jalo and independent media? Why do you think that all of this is happening to you? The direct correlation is the day we bought independent media. If you go into the archives and you research the attacks or the media articles or the campaign, you'll see a direct correlation from the day... So prior to buying independent media, we were the blue-eyed boys. We could do nothing wrong. We had built a multi-billion dollar business, became a World Economic Forum company, uh, employed thousands of people, invested in competitive industries. We did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong, right? So we had won more awards than any other black company in this country, by far. We had three companies listed on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange. Another three companies, we were the significant investor of those companies. We had more than 200 companies in areas from mining, technology, software, food, fishing. We were part owner of the, uh, you know, the largest, uh, one of the largest food companies in Africa. We had partnered and shareholders of multinationals, uh, 14 multinationals on the African continent. So we did nothing wrong. The day we bought independent media is the day absolutely everything changed. The strategy was simple, target independent media because it's now in black hands. It was a real fear that with independent media being in black hands that we would accelerate economic transformation and political transformation for black people in South Africa. My only regret is that we did not do that fast enough, to be frank with you. That even ourselves, we tried to remain balanced, if you know what I mean. We tried to remain too balanced to the extent that we almost became part of the, uh, the mainstream media. And that is my only regret. If I could rewind the clock in terms of our acquisition of independent media, I would by far accelerate the transformation of the media um, in terms of content. I'd, far, I'd by far put out the you know, content that is more bold in terms of the expression of the, the interest of Africans and black people in this economy and on our continent. Um, I think today we're getting there, but we're still not there. We still have a long way to go, to be frank. I think people fear that. They fear the truth. They fear the fact that we can say black people can be intellectuals, musicians, artists, teachers, academics, sports people, business people. They don't want that picture of black people in this country. They want the picture of blacks are savages, they uneducated, you know, all that kind of crap. Only whites are, are and I'm a non-racialist, by the way, just to be clear. Um, but I do believe that, you know, you look at people's potential, black or white, and there's so many, so much beautiful potential amongst black people in this country. And you need to nurture that and grow that to be able to fulfill the dream of an, of an economy, of a country that is able to look after all of its people. So I think people fear that a media house in black hands um, is going to, or they feared that in 2013, and the campaign against me. Subsequent to that, you know, Ramaphosa and his people came to me to help fund their campaign for the um, elections, his first elections in 2017. I didn't want to get involved in the politics of funding campaigns of individuals in the ANC. I've always been a supporter of the ANC from the very beginning. I come out of the ANC like many others and from the time of Mandela was a close confidant. I was always um, very supportive but I elected not to, to, uh, to, to, to fund or take sides in the internal party campaign. I think that has, you know, it's something which has been held against us. But the other thing that's come out is the exposure by some of our editors um, about the private affairs of the president, something which I didn't agree with, by the way, just to be clear about, and also the funding of the president's campaign of about $2 billion. 
So that was, um, you know, run by, and I think since those exposés in our media and exposing the corruption, regrettably, by some of my own ANC friends and comrades, right? So it's very, some of, the, some of my friends call me and say, but Doc, you're one of our comrades, you know, but your newspaper is writing all these things. Now, of course, I don't write anything. The journalists write it. The editors decide what goes in the newspaper. But I myself would wake up in the morning and then I will read. Or sometimes people would call me and say, how could you write this about us, you know? You're part of the, the party historically, etc. Now you're giving the whites the... And I say, look, corruption is corruption, guys. You know, you can't, you can't bleed this country. Like, take PPE. You know, we were the first to expose the 32 billion PPE corruption. What happened after we exposed the first 150 million? The, all the other media said it was fake news. They denied completely the fact that uh, Priscilla Deco and um, her husband. The late husband, tragically, he died. You know, uh, had um, uh, had looted the the Gauteng, uh, of 150 million for the PPE contracts, and the statements after statements came out by the government saying this is fake news. To the extent they even changed the companies that were the beneficiaries of this. We persisted, and after we persisted, we proved it, and after we proved that. We opened up a Pandora's box that all people involved in government at various levels, at national, provincial, municipal level, and in total the SIU now says that the amount of money that they have stolen from PPEs is somewhere between 16 and 32 billion. Now, my point of view, I supported my journalists and my editors in publishing that against powerful politicians because it is the poor that go to the hospitals that need the PPE, the nurses, the doctors, the health workers. Poor patients go. Why, why must you charge for a mask, you know, 10 times what it costs or 100 times what it costs? Why must the poor suffer by charging so much they don't have access to these things? So we owe it as a duty of care to our people to expose these things. In doing so, we anger really powerful politicians. You know, to fight corruption is very difficult. It's very, very difficult because, um, first of all, you, st you stand, uh, you know, to be smeared by the powerful and they build the story around you because that's the only way they can get out of it. And secondly, you risk everything. You know, both your personal life, your family life, you risk um, your businesses, you risk your legacy uh, when you take on the, 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 the powerful and you expose their, their wrongdoings. But I do so not because one is vindictive. One does so because we love our country. We love our people. Let me drive to the final point um, of this interview because you say a lot of, uh, a lot of things, a lot of issues that uh, quite frankly can be quite worrying. And this is coming out of one of Africa's most successful democracies, uh, at least by the international standard. And my question then is, what does this say about South Africa's democracy, first of all, and um, what does it say about the future of this country? Well, let's start from my vantage point, which is I love my country. I love all of its people. I don't love the physical beauty only of Cape Town or of our country. I love our people and I really believe that we are such a wealthy country that it is possible that we can take our people out of poverty. We can create the opportunities, you know, we can, we can meet people's aspirations. I really believe that and I really believe that this is a country that black and white can actually live in harmony together. But in order to do that, there are certain basic fundamental principles that must be followed. The first is that you must respect the Constitution. The second is that you cannot be corrupt. The third is that you must make sure that you're not greedy. And you must make sure that you create jobs and opportunities for ordinary people. And that you must be prepared to share the economy with the people of this country. And that is what we are fighting for, right? 
you are right that this is a powerful economy, it's a powerful system, but the Constitution and the paper it's written on is only as, as, as worthy as the practice. If you subvert that using state institutions, using uh, uh, all sorts of proxies, you know, rigging elections, doing things the wrong way, you subvert the Constitution. And that, you see, is a problem for me because many South Africans have, have, have sacrificed themselves during the days of the struggle. Uh, either they've died, they've been imprisoned, they've been tortured. I was the doctor to many of them during this period. And they, they really stood for these values of bringing genuine freedom to our country. Freedom not just in the sense that you can vote, but freedom in a sense that you know, their children and grandchildren will not have to live in poverty, will not have to live without you know, houses, and have proper health facilities, have good schools, be able to go to university. But now today, if you go to university, 80% of black university graduates do not get a job. 90% of white university graduates walk into a job. There's something fundamentally wrong with that, right? So I agree with you. Because I love my country, I'm doing this. It's easier for me to walk away from all of this, to go live a very different life, and to um, not put up with the smear campaigns, with the sabotage, with economic sabotage, the personal risk to my life, and all of these things. But, you know, unfortunately, I come from that generation that fought the struggle for our liberation and freedom. And maybe I took what Mandela said to heart, maybe I'm one of the few that has taken it to heart. But, you know, that's, that's my truth, that's my authenticity, that's my life. You know, I always say this very affectionately, I have much greater affinity with the poor than I have with the rich. One of, for me, one of my uh, great experiences of my life is that for six weeks I lived in a rural Zimbabwe, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a village uh, as a medical intern. When my colleagues from UCT Medical School had all gone to the fancy hospitals in the world, I decided to do my internship in Zimbabwe, my elective, sorry, in Zimbabwe, in a, in, in a, in a Salvation Army clinic in one of the rural villages. And I sat there and I ate and I stayed in the hut and, you know, had everything that the villagers had. And that showed me, you know, that those people have a right to a better life as we do. And in particular in a country like ours, we have so much wealth, except the wealth is skewed towards very few. And the vast majority, like Cape Town, look at this beautiful place. Well, 10 kilometers out of the city is a very different Cape Town. The vast majority of people that stay on the Cape Flats are unemployed. The vast majority go hungry every day. The vast majority have no chance of getting out of poverty. That cannot be right. You cannot have, you know, in terms of the Gini coefficient, South Africa has the highest in the world. In other words, the gap between the rich and the poor, right? Now, why? Why, why should that be the case? Not in a country that is so wealthy and so rich, as a $400 billion GDP. So maybe it's important for people like myself to be the conscience you know, of the business community and to say, let's do things differently. I would like to support the president and the government of the day, provided they do things right. No one wants to fight the government of the day. No one wants to fight people. But do things right so our reporters don't have to keep on exposing the corruption the looting, the incompetence, the mismanagement of the economy. We'd rather write about the good things of our country. We prefer to praise our leadership as opposed to criticizing them. But if we fail to expose and criticize the leadership of the country for doing wrong, then we are on a slippery slope towards you know, a disaster and, and the poor of this country will forever, never ever forgive us for not having spoken out, for not having exposed these things. Dr. Sarvi, 
thank you for hosting us here at your office. Thank you so much for having me on your show and uh, uh, really appreciate the fact and hope you get to see a bit of the beauty of Cape Town that I was talking about. There's a good view from here, but uh, probably a bit more that I'd like to explore. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, John.